Hey, good afternoon. So, although I work for Microsoft back in Redmond, I'm actually not living there. So, I'm, uh, I live in uh, Switzerland and uh, love climbing and mountains. And uh, I truly actually love also the Western Cape for climbing. So, every time I'm here, I'm actually really, really, a uh, really happy camper. So, I'm working in a team which predominantly uh, looks into strategy. So that means I'm not going to only focus on a product or whatever. So I want to give you just an idea how you can write scalable, scalable apps using Azure as a platform. And I just show you some of the components and some of the screws that you can use to do that. So, But before I start, I really want to get one step back and kind of look at this from a 30,000 feet first. I think what the cloud really gives us, so the one thing I think really changed our industry, it democratizes access to scale and reach. Just digest this a little bit. Access to scale means we have a team of two people. They created a weather forecasting system, which is now running on Windows Azure. If you think about it, Great computer actually got invited to do weather forecasts. Now you, yourself, as a team of one or two people, can do the very same thing that previously only very large organizations were able to do. So access to scale, democratized. I think it's brilliant. To reach, I have many, many partners and customers I'm working with. They don't have a single customer in the country they live. Now you can look at this from an opportunity perspective, but you can also look at this from a threat perspective. There are a couple of Indians which are fairly good in computer science. They will get access to scale and reach. Or you have the ability to access the Indian market because you actually have to reach. So there are two sides of this, but that really drives me. I think that, that economical part to the whole game I think is tremendously interesting. So if you look at the spectrum of IT services, I would split them into two things. Whether you own the hardware or you, ma or you pay as you go. So that's basically the cloud model you pay as you go. And then the second dimension really is whether you manage it yourself. And only platform as a service and software as a service gives you the ability that you don't need to care about OS patching, low balancer configurations, and all that nitty-gritty stuff. And I'm focusing now on platform as a service, so I want to show you how you can write code and automatically deploy that stuff on Windows Azure. So if you talk about Windows Azure, we actually use our data centers for this that we also use for all our other online services, whether this is Hotmail, Bing, Xbox Live, and so forth. So we have eight data centers spread across the US, Western uh, Europe and an APAC. And then the green dots are actually our edge nodes, so where we allow you to cache content at the edge of our own backbone. The SLA that we give you is 99.95, which means the most 20 minutes a month. So the system is down the most 20, 20 minutes a month which includes actually repatching the system while we go, uh, you actually deploying new applications and so forth. And I'm going to show you a mechanism that we built into the platform that allows you to do this in an easy way. But before I continue, although it's called Windows Azure, this is by no means restricted to Microsoft technologies. I mean, we've worked with Linux, and we have, for instance, Ubuntu, we have SUSE running, if you want to use infrastructure as a service. But more interestingly, we work with the Node community and made Node a first-class citizen on our platform as a service offering. So if you have a Node project running in a GitHub repository, you can link this up automatically, and every time you commit something to your branch, it's automatically deployed to your Windows Azure platform as a service. So you're always going to have, for instance, your latest version for testing deployed on one of our servers. So as you see, we're even working with end solutions. So uh, one of the stuff that we do, we have a MySQL as a service offering. 
So that means MySQL managed by ClearDB. And we use this, for instance, for our WordPress installation that also runs uh, in a shared hosting uh, on websites. So that's very, very important. And it's also not like we did this beautiful thing in the past where we took to a, uh, went to an open source project like Python, uh, and then we took Python and we made Iron Python out of it. Uh, this is not the approach where we, we take actually here. What we do is we really work with the teams to make their project a first class citizen and work best on Windows Azure. That is the approach we take there. Uh, you, actually, there is a really, really nice blog post of Mark Shuttleworth, the founder of Ubuntu, uh, and, and about his experience working with us, getting Ubuntu running on Windows Azure. So there are four areas I want to cover today, and I only can scratch on the service, obviously. The first thing is I want to introduce you to something that we call cloud services. And uh, cloud services is a mechanism to write highly scalable solutions. After this, I want to introduce you to our storage options and strategies there, because obviously if you want to write scalable solutions, we heard it today already a couple of times, you need maybe to change your approach related to storage. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about caching and geoscaling. And last but not least, I would like you to introduce to some of our uh, big data as a service offering that we have with Hadoop running on Windows Azure as well. So let's start with cloud services. What that basically means is you're writing your solution and you have a couple of, couple of uh, architectural guidance given by the platform itself. So if you want to have front-end roles which run, uh, which run our IAS, then you would take a web role. If you run backend roles or you would like to run Apache, for instance, you would take a worker role. That means you, all your code runs within that particular context. Once you deploy your solution, you're actually going to define how many instances of this particular role you want to have. And you only deploy your code, your application. You're not deploying an image of your system. That allows us, obviously, to spin up and shut down instances on the fly. What you also see here is that you have multiple storage options. It's not only about SQL databases as a service. If you really want to write highly scalable services, you want to have no SQL structured storage, like table storage and blob storage uh, is available as well. One of the most important bits and pieces, and we already saw that, is the communication between the different roles most likely goes through queues. So we actually have a third storage option which are queues. They are persistent queues, and you can use them even for hybrid scenarios where part of your solution is on-premise while other parts of your solution are actually uh, in the cloud. So that's kind of the blueprint of a highly scalable Windows Azure application. What you see on the very, very left side is the local answer. We configure the local answer automatically for you based on the configuration that you give us, which means every single hit, whether it's a web service, whether it's your website, goes through the local answer, and we do round robin towards one of our service instances. So now let me explain to you how we deploy that stuff and how we automatically can patch the system without shutting down your service. So first of all, you develop your solution, and then you define a service package, which is kind of the metadata that describes the relationship between the different services, and also describes some of the communication ports that you would like to use. And then you kind of deploy that stuff. It's literally just a zip file with an XML file. So you deploy it to Windows Azure. Windows Azure picks that stuff up and sees how many virtual machines it needs to kick off. In this case, it kicks off four virtual machines. As soon as they're up and running, it deploys the service package to all of these four machines. Now our solution seems to be up and running, except that we still need to configure the network local answer. Once that's done, you can connect to the service. And that's all done by basically pushing out your 
config file together with your application. Now, if something goes stodgy, so imagine this side basically goes south. We just spin up another instance, and because we have all the configuration, we know what we need to deploy there, deploy that package, reconfigure the local answer. If you need to have 50% more load, you simply tell us that you need to have 50% more images for this particular service instance. We can them on, deploy the package, reconfigure the local answer. So that's kind of the core principle of the platform as a service offering there. You deploy the application together with the configuration that allows us to automatically scale your solution. The way this actually works is you have a management portal and if you want to have more instances increase the slider. Obviously, if you don't want to do this through a portal, the whole management uh, capability is available through a REST API as well. And we provide you SDKs for Linux, for Mac, and for Windows. Actually, what you see here is our uh, weather forecasting solution. So on the very top, you see the head node of the HPC cluster, which is a medium-sized virtual machine. The middle one is actually the front end, just the website which is again a medium-sized VM, and then on the bottom is really kind of the compute nodes that we use to run a forecast, and as you see there, we actually use larger virtual machines or extra large instances, which come along with more memory. And that is all configured within that configuration file, and we only deploy, in this case, our Now, I was talking about we are able to upgrade the system without taking it down or uh, without affecting, you know, uh, your system that much. So, we, we provide you a DSLA of 99.95 if you have at least two instances up and running. So, that's what we require to do this. So, now, what we have is something like fault domains. So this is a concept that we apply to our data centers. So we basically say, if one rack goes down, or we have a power outage in one part of, of a rack, the likelihood that a rack close to it is going to fail is higher than actually in another location within our data center. So we're going to ensure that these instances are actually spread across these so-called fault domains. You can't say how many fault domains you want because this is something which is given by the way we design the data centers. But the second thing is called an upgrade domain. And that is something you can define how many of them you really want. In this case, you see I have one upgrade domain and I have a second upgrade domain. Which means if I take down all instances in upgrade domain one, I still have two fully running instances on each of the different fault domains. So for instance, if you have a service which runs at 10 instances and you decide you're going to have uh, something like five upgrade domains, then actually eight instances are all the time running as spread across the two fault domains. And this is the way how we can automatically patch the underlying operating system. Uh, this is also the way how you can upgrade your solution. There are other ways. So for instance, you could do a, a RIP swap, so a virtual IP swap. So you could build up a staging environment. And then at the, at, at the point X, you would then suddenly say, now I want to have my staging environment going to be my live environment. But obviously, if you have 100 instances or 200 instances, says you don't want to have a staging environment which it may, might reflect 100% your production environment because that can be fairly, fairly costly. So how does this really work? So what you see, my local engine actually only has a production, a production I, uh, IP there. So I have now my upgrade domain one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take down my on upgrade domain one, so I still have all instances on all other upgrade domains running. 
Once I actually updated these applications, they're coming back again. And then I go and update, update domain two. That's the mechanism how you actually can write the system and you can update the system while it's still running in production. Now let's move on and talk a little bit about storage. And I was in the very beginning mentioning that for many of us, I think we grew up in the age of relational databases. If we had to solve a data problem, we were thinking SQL. Obviously, if you want to write a scalable system, a scalable system which actually scales on commodity hardware, you need to write a system which scales out. And SQL is not necessarily the technology Obviously, the choices that you have at hand are now, <laughs> are now very, very different. So, for instance, if, if you want to have access to cheap storage, then you would actually use table storage. So the way we store stuff on Windows Azure is three times within our data center plus geo-replicated within the very same region. The same applies to blob storage for binary data, and Q is really for inter inter-instance communication. So personally, I think you only should use SQL database as a service if you really have the need for consistency uh, and the transactions which come with it. Because obviously, you need to partition your solution. If you're going to go into table storage, we ask you to tell us what is your partition key. And this is the indicator for us then to ensure that everything within that particular decision, a partition lands on the very same physical node. That obviously comes with a price. Because if you're going to send a query and your query doesn't contain a partition key, we don't know to which physical node we need to go and your, your query is just going to be bloody slow. So one of the rules obviously is you need to find the right partitioning and every query that you execute needs to have a partition key. Which then leads to a second thing that we need to change coming from relational databases is having stuff duplicated, actually aggressively duplicated, is OK. So if you have a table one which has a partition key customer, it is very easy to do queries which involve a customer ID. However, if you would like to know, what are the customers who, sold, uh, who bought a certain product? This becomes very difficult because that particular query doesn't have the partition key customer. So the solution there is you're actually creating a second table, a redundant table, which has different information in there. And the information is actually partitioned on the product key. So you can search for the product and you get all the customers back. So I think that's one of the key things we really need to change. If you go into NoSQL storage, storage becomes cheap. It's actually OK to have redundant data, even be very aggressive to have redundant data. To put this actually a little bit different, I think in the old world of SQL, we optimized for inserts. And in the new world, of NoSQL storage, we have to optimize for reads. For many of us, I assume this is a, a kind of a challenge to find the right partitions. And if you look at all the large scale systems, one of the things you're constantly going to revise is how can you partition your system the right way so it really scales very nicely. Now, Windows Azure gives you also a built-in caching functionality. And it actually supports memcache there, too. The real benefit about the built-in caching functionality means you leverage already paid compute resources. Because what we do is we put the cache on the instances which are already there and use still available memory to actually do the caching. So built in into the whole platform as well. Now that is caching within your service. But if you have a global solution, 
you actually might end up with the point that the latency from where your data is to your customer becomes an issue. And that's where we give you the ability to use our content delivery network. So you can choose between 24 different edge nodes that we have. That means if you use a different URL of that particular resource, then we are actually going to cache this at the edge. So in the case, if you're writing software, which is also consumed in Australia, but you pick, for instance, Europe as your prime data center, this reduces actually the latency massively of your application. We've worked with a couple of partners on this, and it's dramatically, if you design a solution around these principles, how well that actually scales across the globe. And the last thing about scaling globally that I would like to introduce you to is something that we call the Windows Azure Traffic Manager, which means the URL that you give to your customers to address, uh, to, to access your, your solution, is not necessarily the URL he's really going to hit later on. Because he first goes to the traffic manager, traffic manager realizes where this, posi where, where this person is located, and actually knows what is the fastest or, or the, low, the shortest latency to get there, and redirects him to the actual instance. So if you, for instance, have multiple data centers that run your solution. So that are all capabilities that you can take advantage of if you're actually building solutions on, on Windows Azure. Now I really want to change gear. Uh, I personally believe uh, that in a couple of years, we just realized that having data IP is pure currency. Just a quick question. So who of you stores all the log files of your servers? All. OK. Everyone else throws away quite some interesting data. And one of the reasons why, why we do this is because storage was expensive. If you think about traditional data warehousing, what you do is you design something uh, where you think this is going to be important in the future, and everything else you throw away. So you're never going to get more out of it than what you put in. So even in five or six years, you're limited to the data that you thought is going to be useful under the conditions six years back. Now, because data becomes tradable, if you think about all the open data and all that stuff which is going on, you're going to get more data sources that allow you to correlate data. So which means if you just wouldn't have thrown away your weblog data because now you've got very interesting data coming from another source that you could use to correlate and really make business sense out of it. So for me, that is a, a tremendous opportunity going forward and really thinking about data a little bit differently. I mean, we already have uh, a couple of startups that really sell data. That se they sell data that they actually collected through the usage of their websites, the usage of their devices, and so forth. And just think about the amount of data Facebook, Google, Twitter, and so forth have about the usage of devices, about the usage of websites, the locations of people, and so forth. This is pure gold. So how do you do this? You basically just store, 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 store. So big data consists of two steps. Step one is store, and store, and store. And once you stored enough data, the second important step is you move the compute to the data, because there is a gravity around data. You can't move now the petabyte of data around. By the way, uh, about big data, Hadron, the Hadron Collider in the CERN in Switzerland, do you know how much data this guy accrues? Hmm? 
Um, not so sure. Any any bets? It's one petabyte per second. Do you get one petabyte per second? <laughs> now think about it. What is the hard drive size you have? Just roughly. You, you would sell, you would, yeah, you would buy 50 hard drives a second, isn't it? I mean, that's a real big data problem. But to, to be very real, you have a big data problem as soon as your data can't be stored on one physical node. This is the smallest big data problem that you're going to have. But as soon as you have to be storing that stuff on more than two nodes, you need to move compute to the data because you can't move the data around. And that's why the CERN uses Hadoop to solve their problem. Who, who knows about Hadoop? Who knows it very well? OK. So I'm not boring you then. OK. Hope so first of all, to really understand Hadoop, Hadoop is based on a distributed file system. That means you can have 10,000 of nodes, and it looks like, wow, it's one big drive. So that's one concept. You have a distributed file system. And I know customers who only use it for that particular person. You can have multiple nodes in parallel, and you can store stuff there, and you don't need to care how it's stored. That's the storing stuff I was talking about. But as soon as you want to do more than storing, if you want to retrieve stuff, you kind of need to move compute to these thousand of nodes. And that's where we're going to have MapReduce. MapReduce is the algorithm that allows you to split a compute problem and run it in parallel on multiple nodes. And the interesting thing is, you're just going to get one result back. Like, it would be just one simple query. And then on top, what you really see is PIC. So PIC allows you to do data flow. So classical ETL, I take the data from here, I run that query, and I store it there. HiveQL, and I'm going to show this later on. HiveQL is like SQL with the huge difference that the query actually runs highly parallel on HDFS. Now, what we did, and, and that's the reason why I'm actually talking about this, we created Hadoop as a service. So currently, if, if you run Hadoop, uh, you most likely need to configure your server farm and your cluster. So now if you run Hadoop as a service, you just say how many clusters you want to have. And you say, I want to have 100, and this is the data I want to store there. But before I go a little bit further, I quickly want to introduce you. I, I know all of you heard it, and I don't ask whether uh, you're an expert in it, but I just want to walk you through. And if you already know how it works in detail, then it's a good exercise as well. Functionally, MapReduce is very simple. So if you want to create a MapReduce implementation, you write two functions. You write the map function, and you write the reduce function. And most likely, you're going to write it in Java, because MapReduce is, based, uh, is written in Java. So your map function gets a key one and a value one, and it emits a list of key two and value two. So many key two and value two, key two, value two, key two, value two, a list. And now happens some magic in between. So what's now happening is Hadoop shuffles that stuff, sorts it, and then calls in a highly parallel fashion, again, the reduce function, where it gives you a key and the list of all values which previously have been emitted with that particular key. That's how you can run it highly parallel. And you emit then again a key two and a value two. Now, the hello world of Hadoop is word counting. 
I mean, if you want to be really serious in word counting, you count the words of the internet, and then you want to get the top 10 words currently stored in the internet. That's possible, or a library, or a book. That's the hello world of Hadoop. What you see here is JavaScript code, because we have a JavaScript implementation of uh, Hadoop that allows you to write, actually, Hadoop stuff in JavaScript rather than Java, which you can imagine makes it much, much smaller. Over here, key value, what I actually get is either the book, the internet, or just the line of the book. And then I split this into words, and for every word, I do nothing else than emit the word as the key, and then a value one. I'm not counting, because I do highly parallel stuff. I don't know, you know how much I get. Maybe it's a stream. So I emit the word, and one. And then the shuffling takes place, and the reduce function then gets the word and the value. And the value is one. But because I get a list, I can now nicely iterate over this and just add the values together and after this emit again my key, which is the word, but then the sum of that particular word. So you see the cool thing is you can highly parallelize this. So let's do this quickly with a very little sentence. So the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. So the map function oops, does nothing else than actually breaking it up into the word and emit one. Now the Hadoop magic takes place and we shuffle it. And you see here, I get one key, the, but I get two values. So for me it's no problem now to split every single input across these reduce functions in parallel. Because the only thing they need to do is to sum the list together. Now, obviously, uh, this is a fairly simple example, but it becomes very interesting if your data grows, 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 and is stored across thousands of nodes. And the one thing uh, I really would like to get your focus on as well is, it's not only about data that you collect over time. You can actually use this also to run simulations. So where you artificially create a tera, a petabyte of data, and then run certain type of simulations, and then delete the data again. And that's something I want to show you now. So what we're going to do together is with my HD Insights, or the Hadoop Insight cluster that I have, that I proudly own in the cloud as an individual. Isn't it cool, huh? I have a Hadoop cluster. Uh, I, I'm going to do a P calculation with you based on Monte Carlo style simulation. It takes much longer than I would do it just simply in JavaScript, but it's much cooler. So let me show you. So this is kind of uh, the Hadoop dashboard on, on Windows Azure. So what I'm going to, uh, first, we, we built in some, some cool stuff like the JavaScript. Uh, I can show you now. Otherwise, you know, you would actually need to RDP into, and, uh, into, your, uh, into your head node to do stuff. But oh, now it becomes difficult. Typing. So. I can now look into the head node. So you see it's a fairly empty <laughs> Hadoop cluster. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to deploy now a Java application which does exactly this P calculation. It's a sample. So the P estimator. So the way we do this, I can quickly show you this. So we're going to plot, so we're going to create 16 squares. And then the map function does nothing else than plot randomly 
10 million dots. And the reduce function then is going to count how many of these dots is within the circle and how many of these dots is without the circle, uh, outside of the circle. And obviously, by having this, you can just see that uh, you can then simply calculate uh, for then everything inside divided by the total. Fairly simple. So let's deploy this to my cluster. So this is how I configure the job. 16 squares, 10 million points, and I execute this job. Uh, Hadoop is actually extremely chatty. So it really loves talking to you. Uh, so uh, you will see later on a fairly large output. But in the meanwhile, I'm going to show you Hive. Because there is a cool thing about Hive. Uh, do you remember what Hive is all about? Hive is like SQL on top of Hadoop. So, and I have a Hive interactive console. And in here, I can actually show you something. I stored some web log information as sample data. And now I can send to this particular web log information a SQL-like sta SQL -like statement. And you wouldn't recognize it's not SQL. So, so I start from the uh, Hive sample table. And I get a tabular output now. So what you see here is, from our web log information, you see the device, platform which is used, the device, the type, location, and so forth. Because it's a tabular output, we actually created an ODBC driver for Hive, which means you can use existing BI technology to view at that data. So what you see here is nothing else than this data overlaid over a Bing map on PowerView in Excel, which shows you the bigger the dots, the more people visited our site. Not bad, so in terms of don't throw your web, data, web log data away, but that's only part of the story, because I also can now have my device platform, and I kind of see that RIM, which is that green stuff, seems to be very popular, popular on the East Coast, seems to be a banker to see or something like that. Android heavily overtook uh, iOS on the West Coast, and there is an okay population of Windows phones in Washington. <laughs> But I think you got the point. Starting out with big data, do some number crunching on top of this, then put it into a format that other people really can make business decisions with, or you're actually offering this data on a marketplace and see it as part of your business model. So I personally think big data, and now with this democratized access to scale, Cheap storage in the cloud opens up tremendous opportunity for every one of us. So with this, i kind of heading back to my presentation. We'd like to close on what I just showed you. So first, if you want to write highly scalable applications on Windows Azure, you will actually use cloud services. It gives you multiple storage options and capabilities. We provide you with the caching infrastructure in place within the service, but also geocaching and even a traffic manager. And then last but not least, really come up with a big data strategy. Because as soon as you're going to store your data on more than one drive, you kind of have exactly that particular problem that you need to move compute to the data and not the other way around. So with this, uh, the only thing I can say is, you get actually 10 websites for free, so you can start there. 
With a website, I mean you can deploy your Node.js applications, you can deploy your PHP application, your Rail application, or whatever. We even have something which is called mobile services. You get 10 of them for free as well. Uh, so you don't need to spend a single buck to kind of experience what it means uh, building solutions with platform as a service. Uh, do we have time for some questions? Oh, yeah. Questions? I'm um, just uh, t uh, t uh, two questions. One is how is Pi doing? But, um, and the, uh, how is Pi Oh, yeah. Doing? yeah. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. P, pi, yeah. Uh, it's, it's doing well. <laughs> OK. And the second one was when you did the select statement, um, the, the web log, was, is that a flat file stored in that file system? No, so what we, when I did, uh, I actually create the configuration of that particular uh, tabular up front. Okay. So and this is something you can actually do, uh, do through Hive, yeah. Okay. So, so your web server is actually logging already in a tabular format, is that right? No, the, the web server is, was just a flat file, and then we just mapped stuff. Uh, using your map reduce? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So it seems I lost my internet connection. Always a problem with live demos. Yeah, but I mean, you're a wimp if you're not doing it, isn't it? <laughs> Failing in pride is always a great thing. I, I'm going to send you the result. <laughs> now, it's, it's actually, it's, it's actually a down to the eighth digit. But what I would like have to show you is, you know, how chatty it is. It basically tells you, uh, it kicks off this map task, it creates the input for that map task, and then it starts to reduce, sometimes in parallel, sometimes not. You really see uh, that you only write a map function, a reduce function, and the rest is done by the framework. And this becomes tremendously interesting if you have to have recommendation engines and all that kind of stuff, where you really need to make sense out of a lot of data. And in a Hadoop ecosystem, you get a lot of existing frameworks that help, help you doing that stuff. I still have no, I, I, it really looks like I just lost my internet connection, so sorry. Ah, it's back. Look, it's completed. Now, I'm gonna get my job history here, and then you see what I mean with being chatty. And that was, was a small task. So this is the output. First it wrote the input for the 16 maps. And then you see it, it just started to reduce the stuff. And it actually only started uh, to map the stuff. And it only started to reduce when it already had the map finished. But it's very likely that it actually does that stuff in parallel if it already has enough stuff around there. And the result? Shouldn't be a big surprise, it's actually here. The key point he, that I wanted to demonstrate is even if you don't have data, you can solve certain problems in a complete different way out of the box by applying, for instance, Mon Monte Carlo style simulation. And especially in the financial industry, uh, you just know when you need to run simulation, this is extremely powerful. Sorry, over here. Um, just a question on, you said obviously data being gold and... Uh, Excuse me? Uh, so, but are you, can you hear me now? Yes. Sorry, you mentioned that data being currency and it worth gold. I was just wondering in terms of security and securing that data, which is now obviously a commodity, uh, what is the security layers and the implementation of the security especially in terms of possibly a financial yeah. institution? Uh, this, is a, this is a perfect question. So about cloud and security. I, I always look at this kind of multi-folded. 
So first, the physical security, I challenge every single person that runs a data center that it runs it better than the large scale data centers run by the cloud players. Just to give you an example, our data center in Ireland is in a no-fly zone. Ireland has two tanks, and we have a tank barrier in front of the data center. <laughs> the only thing that leaves the data center is dust and visitors. <laughs> now, if we get into data, you know, more the regulations, the compliancy, and all that stuff, that's really a different story. I personally believe that not all data will live in the cloud. So that's why the future of enterprise-like solutions is basically hybrid. So you need to know what workloads you can actually offload into the cloud, what is the data that benefits from the economy of scale of the cloud, and what stuff makes sense to kind of keep close to you just because of compliance and regulations. In Europe, I mean, we, I always say, look, if you can make it work for Germany, it works everywhere. <laughs> and uh, we actually made it work for Germany. Which doesn't mean you should just store everything in the cloud, but it means you should apply uh, all the architectural principles around encryption and all that stuff on top of what we provide out of the box. One more question, anyone? Or that guy. Uh, two quick questions. Uh, the first is, uh, do you have an edge server in South Africa? Where's the nearest edge? No. Uh, second question is... Uh, can, I, can I add something to this? Yep. Look, I was in, I was in New Zealand. And uh, New Zealand is way worse than South Africa in terms of bandwidth. But I met so many people there that the, the cloud is the only way to actually deliver a service outside of New Zealand and South Africa without really having issues and to matter about that particular connection. But yes, we don't have an edge server here. Uh, and then uh, your virtual servers are all strange sizes, like 1.75 gigs. Uh, they're not, you know, 2048 or, or 512. Uh, wh why, are the, why are they weird sizes? Uh, I'll talk to you uh, one-on-one later. No, but I mean, it's an engineering point. I think you get, get the... Okay, um, out of time. Thank you very much, Beat. Um,